Hola, todo el mundo, and thank you for joining us uh, for Puerto Rico's Gene and Cell Therapy and Unparalleled Proposal for Non-Diluted Funding webinar. This is part of a series of Invest Puerto Rico's webinar series. To learn more about Invest Puerto Rico and the island's official business attraction and FDI organization, please visit Invest Puerto Rico, Invest PR, excuse me, .org. We're excited to have you join the conversation this, today. We received questions submitted by you through the registration form. And if you'd like to submit one during the webinar, please use the ask a question feature located at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Now, uh, we all know about Puerto Rico's storied history in pharma and med device these past 60 years. I commonly refer to Puerto Rico as America's medicine cabinet when meeting globally. But today's presentation and today's pre presenter is going to talk about new opportunities that are unique in this industry moving forward. His perspective comes from an extensive education coupled with years of experience both on and off the island. Will, more on Will in just a moment. My name is Michael Gay. I'm the Chief of Business Development for Invest Puerto Rico, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I want to first and foremost thank Invest Puerto Rico and Cito, uh, Ocean Bio's marketing teams for getting everything in place for today's presentation. These events don't happen without a ton of collaboration, preparation, and behind the scenes work. Now, hope, having said that, I hope there are no glitches. What you are going to hear today, though, I feel is very unique and special in Puerto Rico. The underlying principle of today's event is outlined in its title, and, and that is to showcase both the events and unparalleled opportunity for securing non-diluted financing and bioscience talent in Puerto Rico for gene and cell therapy companies involved in research and development. The R&D component is something that this island has not been a strong point in the past. And we are working very hard and showing examples of how this is changing. Will approached me back in February about this topic. And we we're glad to be able to finally feature him and his expertise today. This pre presentation is also timely as the island has a new PDMO process development manufacturing operation facility coming online soon to cater to gene and cell therapy and biologic startups. We also have 25 businesses, academics, and investment experts from the island attending the bio convention in San Diego in June. And this is live, uh, not virtual, which is very exciting for all of us. And everybody will be in Invest Puerto Rico's booth, connected to and collaborating with all, all of the attendees. And lastly, we're looking to meet with companies at BIO and follow up from this, this conversation today um, and, uh, and the many other events that we're gonna plan to attend in this space that wanna take advantage of what Will is presenting today. Now back to the speaker. William Rosalini is a former major, minor league baseball pitcher uh, who holds five master's degrees in addition to a law degree is currently the president of Cytoimmune Therapeutics, a company developing immunotherapy drugs in the oncology space on the island. Will has over two decades of experience in the emerging technology space, and he spearheaded the success of numerous startups as a founder. He's an expert in using non-diluted funding to bridge the valley of death where so many startups die um, in all sectors. He currently resides in Puerto Rico with his wife and three kids. Now, please join me in welcoming Will Rosalini. Take it away, Will. Thanks, Michael. And thanks to the Invest PR team um, for all they, uh, all they did to put this together. Uh, I've got some slides that I think should be showing, uh, and I'm going to jump right into it. So <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today is emerging technology companies and non-dilutive funding. But I wanted to start with probably the best uh, in the history of receiving non-dilutive funding is Elon Musk and his companies. So at last count, and this was a study done back in, in 2015, uh, his companies had raised almost $5 billion in governmental support. So Elon Musk, Tesla, um, uh, Neuralink, uh, all the companies under his umbrella have mastered the art of negotiating governmental subsidies on a federal level, on a state level, and on a city level. And so the reason I bring this up in the start of this conversation is 
um, having a non-dilutive funding strategy for an emerging technology company is not a, a nice to have anymore. It's, it's really a requirement as part of the overall capital strategy for a company. So today I'm going to talk to you about a, a common misconception whereby non-dilutive funding for industry does not just mean the SBIR program run by the U.S. federal government. Um, the opportunities to get uh, non-dilutive funding are extensive, and there's ways to think about it strategically that include uh, both where you locate the startup, where you locate activities on an international basis, and how you maximize your chance for non-dilutive funding. Now, that term might not be familiar uh, to everybody, so what, when we say non-dilutive funding, we essentially mean bringing cash to an operation without having to sell shares and thereby diluting your ownership. So this could be grants, this could be prizes, this could be licensing, this could be tax credits. And so I'm going to walk you through all of the different ways to get the cash that your emerging technology company needs in order to expand and to grow. Uh, and, and it's a lot more than just the federal SBIR program. A little bit about uh, myself. So I was a, a former minor league baseball player that, that couldn't figure out how to throw my curveball for a strike in the big leagues. So I retired uh, and took advantage of Major League Baseball's college scholarship program. So I was a graduate student for the better part of 10 years, accumulated a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge in what I'd call the failure modes associated with translational life sciences, and ultimately became um, the graduate student that professors trusted to start their companies. So have spent a lot of time thinking about how to bring early stage innovation out of the academic labs, out of the hospitals, uh, out of the inventor's hands, and, and into a, a fundable company. So along that line, um, I have raised about 100 million in venture capital, uh, been a part of six startups. I'm currently um, employee number one and president of Cytomune Therapeutics, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and, and each of these companies, I have uh, done a different non-dilutive funding strategy. So the first strategy that was employed, this was almost uh, 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago now, where it was a, a, a focus on primarily the NIH SBIR program. Uh, so, so raised a lot of money using sort of what I call a traditional non-dilutive funding strategy. Uh, a second company... Uh, got a $50 million BARDA federal contract. This was uh, an imaging, a medical imaging company out of Dallas that I ran. And so that was a, a different way to approach the financing. And then I got involved with uh, international grants and tax regimes in Belgium, Germany, and Luxembourg, and uh, sort of thought through all of the different ways um, to utilize international subsidies uh, uh, before Cytoimmune. I actually ran a Canadian company that, that, that I took public, and they actually received an, about an $8 million uh, award from the state of Texas. So there's actually a state award that, that's pretty sizable uh, uh, as well that, that, that we can talk to. Lastly, I've been in Puerto Rico since 2016. I originally moved with my wife and kids for the individual uh, investor um, uh, tax situation but learned while I was here that there's some really unbelievable opportunities to start and grow emerging tech companies, not just selling gene therapy, but any uh, company that's doing uh, uh, R&D under Puerto Rico's Act 60 program. And so I'll tell you at the conclusion uh, why I think that setting up your company in Puerto Rico and then layering in the non-dilutive funding strategy that I'm going to tell you is, is, is a best in class approach to be able to grow your startup. So first, I, I want to talk about uh, something that I call expanding your capital. So if you look at the cost of capital, which basically means if you're a uh, company, what is the cost for you to get cash into your business? So uh, in, a, in a traditional example, if you're a company trying to buy a piece of real estate, the cost of your capital would be the interest rate on the loan to get the cash needed to buy the real estate. So that's a low cost of capital because there's a hard uh, asset at the other side of that loan. So you get a lower cost of capital. As you develop these intangible assets like intellectual property and research and development, 
your cost of capital goes up. And obviously, as your uh, uh, technology is earlier in the development phase, it's riskier, and therefore your cost of capital is very high. So the, the highest cost of capital is going to be early stage seed investment from angel investors who will take anywhere from uh, 20 to 40% of your business for, for a low amount of invested capital. And then you have venture capital, which comes in at a certain stage uh, and, 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 and then takes you through a certain stage. Ultimately, then you'd be on your way to potentially IPOing and raising money from uh, a variety of different private equity, mezzanine debt, senior debt, and then ultimately getting to uh, public company financing, which is which is one of the lower costs of capital for companies. Now, when you look at grants and tax credits, obviously free money is a zero percent cost of capital, and so by bringing in a non-dilutive strategy. Uh, like I'm going to propose, you could bring your blended rate uh, cost on your capital down. And so my belief is not only should you do this to lower your cost of capital, this also helps you when you're talking to investors to expand their capital. So an investor putting $10 million into your Series A is very excited to learn that you're going to also be bringing in an additional 5 to $7 million of non-dilutive capital that doesn't dilute their ownership in the company either. So the way that we think about this is we want to have a combination of tax credits uh, and grants that work in combination with the right stage funders, so angels for pre-seed pre and seed, and then VCs uh, in the A and B and, and, and onward in the institutional rounds, and then ultimately in the life sciences, uh, a lot of companies go pu go public very early. So that's an opportunity in the biotech space that's that's maybe different in some of the other uh, industries that, that you might be attending from today. So the way that we do that is we look at the technology um, stack that the company is trying to develop, and then we do a, a worldwide scope for all the relevant funding opportunities. Um, when we do that, we then create a grant strategy that includes multiple submissions. Uh, I always told my early teams the best way to, to get more grant funding is to write more grants. And so ultimately layering and having a multi-submission strategy and investing in the process is, 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 is required. And then ultimately your team needs to bring in the right consultants who are able to improve the quality of those applications. And then, and then actually uh, you'd want to be developing and aligning your design of experiments in a way that gets you the preliminary data needed so that these uh, grant applications are more successful. Um, when we were writing our uh, SBIR grants back in the day, the national average or hit rate is 18% or approximately 18% year over year. Uh, when, when, we were, um, when we were writing them, we were getting about 33%, so approximately double the, the national average. Hey, Will, um, do you, when you apply for federal grants, do you have to notify each agency that you have other applications submitted for similar, uh, you know, similar assets in the stack? Yeah, so there's the that's why the multi-submission grant strategy includes there's no double dipping. So you're you're not supposed to get funding to do the same uh, set of experiments. And so that's why you want to have a global strategy as opposed to a, a one off, you know, write, write one grant per year and not think through the overall design of experiments. Right. Thank you. The, the thing that's the thing that I, I think that, that's important to, to understand is um, grants can be written uh, based on where you are. So if you're in, in Belgium, you, you're eligible for Belgium grants. If you're in the US, you're eligible for US federal grants and state grants. And so um, understanding where to locate your startup is critically important. And so what I'm going to show you is that I think the, the best possible non-dilutive funding strategy is to be a Puerto Rican company, uh, which makes you eligible for their tax credit Act 60 regime, and then be able to apply for U.S. federal funding. Uh, so that's, that's the best of both worlds, and I'll walk you through how that looks. So that's kind of the conclusion as to, as to what I think is the best strategy, but I'm going to walk you through how I got there uh, as, as we go through the presentation. So what we were talking about was how to set up the, the startup or the, uh, or the company in a way 
to maximize both the tax credit uh, regimes and uh, federal funding, whether international or U.S. And so the way that that looks is you, you go after the economic incentives, uh, you add that with the research and development tax, and that brings the not the non-dilutive capital back in the, into the into the company. You you can't double dip or double count, um, but in some cases, federal funding moving into state funding is allowed. So, for example, Kentucky will uh, allow you to get a, um, a federal SBIR from, uh, and then they will match with Kentucky state funds. Uh, your SBIR funding. So I'll, I'll walk you through how all this works um, and, and kind of explain why I think that Puerto Rico is the best place uh, to set up your R&D operations. So a little bit of background on the non-dilutive market generally. Um, you're looking at nearly $50 billion that's uh, allocated across non-dilutive funding at um, NIH, so Health and Human Services, you also have uh, um, other governmental bodies like uh, FDA, uh, CDC, and BARDA operating underneath HHS. You have the National Science Foundation, which is totally separate from NIH. And then, of course, the Department of Defense, which comprises Army, Navy. Um, uh, you'd also have DARPA. Uh, CDRMP is the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. So tons of programs underneath these um, uh, governmental bodies at the U.S. federal level. Then you have private foundations uh, like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is focused on uh, Parkinson's research, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and many more. Those private foundations uh, really like to give grants for disease-specific indications. They love you to actually add on federal research funding and um, and so layering in these non-dilutive sources is a, is is welcomed at the foundation level. It gets more money for their disease indication. And then lastly, uh, countries, certain countries, have grant and tax credit um, regimes that that encourage research and development. So I'll walk you through how Canada, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg all work, and then ultimately walk you through the tax credit regimes. There's there's four. Um, that I'm going to talk about. There are others, but this will give you enough information to be able to navigate kind of what the next steps would be as you evaluate the non-dilutive funding strategy for your company. So when, when you look at the overall R&D process, and I'm using a, a cell and gene therapy or a, a biotechnology process, so you go from discovery to preclinical development, then phase one, phase two, and phase three studies, and then ultimately commercialization whether uh, through license or through building out a commercial enterprise and, and doing sales yourself. You can look at the probability of success there at the bottom of the, of the pipeline to a, to a licensed product from the stage. And then I've, I've sort of broken out where the federal funding can come from across the various institutes and what they'll pay for. So the NIH R21 program, which is a US federal grant program, would fund discovery work and preclinical development. The SBIR program, which is R41 to R44, which is just a designation that NIH uses, would fund uh, preclinical development, early stage research. NSF is more engineering centric um, than life science centric, so uh, would be, would be uh, funding prototype development and early stage testing. DOD funds uh, preclinical into phase one, and then international grants will fund preclinical development um, as well. And then as you move forward into your clinical testing, there are specific mechanisms at the federal level and state levels uh, to fund your clinical studies. And then there's actually commercial grants. So there's commercialization grants at the federal and state level that you can apply for um, in order to deploy the innovation um, uh, uh, out on, on a commercial level. So when we look at kind of the biggest uh, uh, bucket of funding out there, it's, it's certainly in the U.S., the U.S. federal funding. Uh, these numbers are from 2017, but NIH alone uh, has a, a $34 billion budget of which there is a set aside specifically for small business innovation research of 3% of the total NIH budget. And so that's just the R programs, that's 50% of the budget. 
the U program are federal contracts for research and development um, that, that you can go into as well. I'm not going to go deep into how to get the U.S. federal grants. We can, we can maybe do that in a different discussion, but wanted to give you a feel for the size and scope of the U.S. federal funding. We've also seen uh, over the course of, of research and development, uh, almost 50% of FDA approved drugs have received uh, U.S. federal funding. Um, and so when you look at the success rates of, of, of how federal funding has turned into licensed products or approved products, it's pretty clear that this needs to be part of a life sciences company's strategy in terms of non-dilutive funding. Very quickly, the way these work, uh, you would go to grants.gov, you would look for um, the right sections, the right uh, agencies. So if you're a, a neuroscience company, you would go to the National Institute for Neurological Disease. If you're inflammation, you would go to uh, a, a different NIH agency and you would uh, apply for funding based on the various mechanisms. <clears throat> Very likely you'd be applying as a, as a company for SBIR funding. And then you'd be applying for either a, a phase one or a phase two SBIR. The phase one, you get up to $150,000 of direct costs. Uh, you also get indirect cost rates as well. The, the project can last uh, up to a year. And then for phase two, uh, under SBIR, you could get up to $1.5 million and the projects can last two years. The STTR is for um, a different mechanism same bucket of money but this would be for investigator initiated companies so essentially university professors that maintain their academic position while trying to start the company national hit rates on these are about 18 percent um but but i think if you um if you have a dedicated resource and experts on this you should be looking at hit rates over 30 percent so one out of every three grants that you go in you should be able to get the Department of Defense is another large funding source. Uh, DARPA has um, really interesting high-tech projects uh, that have been funded and DARPA invented. Uh, the, they funded the internet and came up with the concept uh, 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 originally. So a lot of really uh, interesting innovations have come out of DARPA. They have annual calls and RFPs for certain proposals um, that you would just, you would also be able to find through a grants.gov search and um, be able to apply for these through DARPA, DTRA. Uh, there's the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. So a number of programs that you could get not only life science funding for, but, but uh, a number of different emerging technologies funded through this. And then there's BARDA. Uh, BARDA is another governmental program related to medical countermeasures. Um, <laughs> In 2017, I was actually uh, talking with our BARDA um, uh, program manager, and they were running a presentation about how a pandemic could easily uh, address uh, and, and, and end up with the pandemic that we've got, like the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So they were predictive, and, and they also deal with that. So uh, when we look at these opportunities, uh, and I see there's a question, kind of how is this Puerto Rico specific? What I'm proposing is, not only should you optimize how these grants and non-dilutive funding uh, opportunities can come into your company, if you put these grants and opportunities into your Puerto Rico company, there's a doubling effect that I'll explain associated with the tax credit. So I'll get to that here in about five minutes in the presentation. So um, the Puerto Rico Act 60 tax regime. So we'll start to talk about why I think having a Puerto Rico R&D unit is the right choice for most emerging technology companies. So when, when we look at a tax incentive versus a grant, there's some fundamental differences. So for a grant, you write an application, uh, usually for a call, meaning somebody has, uh, the grant manager has written a application specific request for proposal, and then you respond to that grant and assemble the application and it goes through a scoring process where there's a review and then ultimately you're awarded the money and then you're uh, uh, reimbursed based on cost that you expend. A tax incentive program is a little bit different. So essentially with the tax incentive program, you go through a process of saying, I'm involved in these R&D projects. Those projects are approved on an annual basis. And then you file your tax return and you receive your tax credit on the system. 
And that tax credit in some jurisdictions can be sold for cash. In other jurisdictions, it just shows up as cash in your bank account. So uh, now we're talking about different countries and tax incentives versus R&D federal grants. So Australia is, uh, is one such jurisdiction. And basically in Australia, if you do your research and development in Australia, you get a 40 cent R&D tax credit back. So if you spend a million dollars in Australia on an approved program, you'll get $400,000 back. Canada has a similar program called the SHRED Initiative. Uh, Canada's uh, SHRED Initiative gives you anywhere from 15 to 35 percent of your R&D costs back. And in some cases, you get some of that money back as a refundable tax grant. Uh, in the U.S., there is a U.S. federal R&D tax credit of approximately 12 to 16 percent, depending on the activity. And then that amount can also be credited towards state income tax requirements. These are credits that can't be sold. So these can only be applied uh, to your to your uh, federal income tax requirements. In some cases, the U.S. federal R&D tax can be uh, a, a cash grant back to you. Belgium has a program where um, you're not you're not actually getting a tax credit, but they have a patent income deduction regime, which basically means if you develop your intellectual property in Belgium, they will give you an 80 percent reduction in your corporate income tax base. Um, and so not quite a tax incentive in the form of a credit, but a unique regime where you're able to develop R&D in Belgium and then get a lower corporate income tax rate. And then lastly, Luxembourg has a, a, a 50 percent uh, co-financing of research projects for Luxembourg based R&D, uh, but they only they cap that at one point five million in R&D cost. So that's kind of a comparison of everything that's out there. Um, the details of Australia's R&D tax incentive scheme are uh, relevant because I think it's second best to Puerto Rico. So I just kind of walk you through the details here. Uh, it, you, you have the ability to get up to 45%, but it's, it's usually going to be about 40%. Um, and then you're able to get this very quickly after you file your tax return. So within 30 to 45 days, it's a very organized system such that you file your return, you file your report, and you're able to get that cash uh, back, into, back into the company. Uh, it's a multi-year process, so you could do it every year for as long as you're conducting R&D in Australia. So that that's that's a very good tax regime and and place uh, for for doing the credits and it works well for a lot of companies. But I think Puerto Rico is the best jurisdiction for conducting research and development for uh, sort of four reasons. The first is it's the highest tax credit that can be sold for cash in the world. Two, research and development done in Puerto Rico is made in the USA. So Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States, uh, which means the, the, that a lot of the federal set-asides for made in the USA manufacturing, research and development can be done in Puerto Rico and get that claim. Puerto Rico is under the um, uh, federal uh, laws related to intellectual property contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's basically the U.S. legal system. It's the Puerto Rico tax system. So Puerto Rico uh, uh, manages its own tax system, but it's still under the federal regulations of the United States. So it's, a, it's the same as doing business in the United States. Uh, and then in Puerto Rico, since it's a U.S. commonwealth, you can apply as a Puerto Rico company to all of the U.S. federal programs. Um, and so that's something that you can't do with Australia or Canada or Belgian based R&D. So I, I think this is a, a very big advantage to be able to go after the largest bucket of R&D grant funding as a U.S. company, but then also be able to be eligible to receive the R&D tax credits in Puerto Rico. Uh, said another way, in Puerto Rico, if you get a million dollar federal SBIR, and spend that SBIR money uh, in your Puerto Rico um, uh, company, you will also generate a $500,000 tax credit. That tax credit can be sold. And so on, on a million dollar grant, you actually get $1.5 million of cash. So that's why I think this is the best way 
the best way to set it up. Now, a lot of times, um, and I'm not going to name names, but certain states and countries will have attractive regimes, but you really can't find the talent or the expertise that you need to employ to be able to go do the cutting edge R&D. And so that's what makes Puerto Rico unique as well, especially in the cell and gene therapy space and life sciences space. So if you look at the, the way that Puerto Rico has historically been uh, thought of, it's, it's been a pharmaceutical center of excellence for manufacturing for the greater part of 60 years. 12 of the top 20 biologics companies uh, are, are, are pharma companies are here in Puerto Rico. Um, you have 100,000 plus pharmaceutical professionals. It's commonly said in Puerto Rico that you have uh, three languages that are spoken here. You've got English, Spanish, and GMP. Uh, the university system here has the sixth highest availability of scientists and engineers in the world. Um, and then you're, of course, getting infrastructure and logistics that's world class. Um, so the logistics here support pharmaceutical exports um, on a worldwide basis. The FedEx uh, a cold storage facility, for example, for the Caribbean is here in Puerto Rico. So you get all the infrastructure and logistics that you expect from a U.S. Uh, a US uh, uh, basis. In terms of the talent, because ultimately when you get the grant funding or the tax credit funding, you're going to be spending most of your money on R&D labor and talent. If you look at the uh, talent highlights in Puerto Rico, um, you've got a number of different uh, things to point to. Uh, one of the things that I like to, to point out in Puerto Rico is the that NASA makes job offers to every graduate of the University of Puerto Rico Mayaguez program. Um, and so you're, you're looking at a talent base that, that especially now with the great resignation and reset, uh, competition for talent is extraordinary. In my case, uh, and I'll talk about my company, Cytomune, and, and our experience here in Puerto Rico, we've been able to hire close to 50 employees in the last 12 months all of whom, um, about half of whom came from Puerto Rico uh, that filled out very um, uh, complex and uh, detailed requirements in the cell and gene therapy space. But we were also able to convince almost 50% of our new hires to relocate from the mainland into Puerto Rico. So it actually gave us a recruiting advantage to be able to say, uh, come do cutting edge R&D in Puerto Rico and live on the beach. In terms of... Um, uh, employment benefits, there's also some other advantages to Puerto Rico that you don't have in other jurisdictions. The first is um, you're looking at a lower annual wage than places like California or hotbeds for cell and gene therapy, for example, or biotech like in Boston. Uh, in addition, there's a, uh, a, a tax advantage for um, highly qualified technical workers or difficult to recruit workers whereby they, in their individual capacity, receive exemptions for their individual income taxes for uh, anybody that's making over $100,000 a year in salary. So that enables you to recruit uh, hard, hard to find talent and pass on the tax benefits to those employees as well. Um, so, so more detail in terms of exactly how this works. Basically, um, to, to enjoy the benefits of what's called Act 60, your company would need to form a Puerto Rican subsidiary. You do not need to relocate the entire company here. You need to have a subsidiary. That subsidiary applies for an Act 60 uh, decree or basically a contract with the Puerto Rican government. Uh, and then that would entitle you to the 50% um, uh, tax credit on R&D, 30% um, uh, potential for up to 30% cash grants on things like job creation and uh, equipment purchases. There's a 4% corporate tax rate, and then a number of other uh, tax exemptions and benefits that make building out facilities and construction here in Puerto Rico easier and cheaper than in other jurisdictions. So just real quickly, um, you know, uh, Puerto Rico was the, the hub of, of pharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, two things happened. They changed some of the corporate income tax rules, so nothing to do with the R&D tax credit. And uh, pharmaceutical companies started to consolidate. And so you saw a flight from the island for what I call traditional uh, pharmaceutical companies. However, in the last, I'd say, two to three years, 
you're seeing an influx of research and development centric technology companies to take advantage of not only the talent, the infrastructure, but also the very uh, attractive tax regime here. So in kind of conclusion uh, to, to what I think would work, if, if you form your Puerto Rico entity properly, uh, you're gonna be able to rapidly acquire the talent that would allow you to go compete uh, on, a, on a national level for US federal funding. Those federal funds will fall into the tax regime and, and give you a, a, a multiple, multiplicative effect. And that ultimately could drop your research and development costs by anywhere from 40 to 60%. And so I give kind of broad numbers for Cytoimmune. Cytoimmune um, is a cell therapy company developing uh, immunotherapies for oncology. And the rough numbers, these aren't exactly Cytoimmune's numbers, but these are the rough numbers of kind of what you could expect to be able to build out a facility. So this is approximately a $20 million facility. Um, we were able to get almost $19 million in tax credits and state grants from Puerto Rico to build out the facility. And then we have an ongoing uh, benefit, and, and, and this is kind of US versus Puerto Rico generally. So this would be an example cell therapy company with those expenses, where you'd have uh, nearly $20 million of ongoing uh, tax credit benefits through the Act 60 program. And so for uh, Cytomune, that's, that's raised approximately $70 million in uh, institutional venture financing, so dilutive capital, we've been able to add almost $45 million of non-dilutive capital via the Act 60 benefits. And so I think in, in this case, Puerto Rico is, uh, uh, quite frankly, a, the best place in the world to conduct your R&D activities for emerging technologies. So that's all I prepared for today. I think now we can open it up for questions uh, to see, to see what, what, what details we could go into later. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's great to have statements like that coming from the private sector rather than just from Invest Puerto Rico and other, other people involved um, in this industry. Um, a prime example is what Cytoimmune has done. Um, you know, we've got a ton of questions here and um, uh, some are, are regarding, you know, financing the cost, some are regarding energy competition things like that, um, extra sectors. Um, so let's just start with some of them. One thing in particular, one question in particular was what projects can you finance and what can be leveraged? And I'm, I'm assuming is they're, they're getting specifically at what cost would be eligible by a, for these grants or for these incentives that, that qualify for the, 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 the tax incentives or, and or the grants. Yeah, so I'll answer that in two ways. So if you have a, a pre-approved product, like an FDA approved product process, like you would in a, a drug company, then most of your efforts are research and development. Um, and so it's pretty easy to, to get the credit on almost all of your activities since that's what you're doing. You know, Microsoft and Amazon and other large companies have research and development entities here in Puerto Rico. They've been here for years. And so even if you have a commercial stage product, you are doing development activities and research activities that would qualify. And so it depends on the specific situation, but um, that, that's the general rule of thumb. All right. There's another question that talks about clean tech and, and various other energies. Uh, I think it's, it's what are the opportunities for investments in biotech and clean green energy domains like bioethanol, bio CNG, which is compressed natural gas, sustainable aviation fuel and green hydrogen. Do you have any thoughts on these other sectors with regard to your approach? Do you have any experience or anything you want to say on that? Uh, I, I would say that I, I understand my circle of competence. And so I'm, I'm barely competent in one field. I would say that um, Puerto Rico is unique given all of the pharmaceutical excellence. I'm not sure how much clean tech talent is currently on the island. That said, I'm not an expert, so wouldn't be able to opine. The system would work the same way for clean tech product development under Act 60 as it would for a, a life science or a biotech company. Perfect. Um, another question regarding energy, it says, can you paint a picture of the current flight of pharma out of the island due to outages? Um, 
I'd like to start out and make a couple comments regarding that. And then I'd like you to follow up from your experience. But one of the things that Invest Puerto Rico realizes is that energy has been historically an issue and the island's on the right path. When we cite companies down here, we introduce them to energy partners, which is really key so that they can do renewable and off the grid opportunities right from the get go. The other thing I want to talk about is the trans, the, the, the transfer of the t and system from PREPA to LUMA, which is private sector. And what I think is important there is, is in the last year, and it's almost been a year, the average outage duration has dropped by almost 45%. Uh, the number of sustained outages by the average customer has dropped almost 18%. The average outage time period has dropped from 97 minutes to 177. These are all statistics that are really important. Now, it hasn't been perfect at the same token. We're trending so much in the right direction. And, and, and to be honest with you all, um, you know, there's been an increase of, of energy capacity on the island by over 42% since there's 17,000 new houses online. So those are some statistics. I haven't heard of any company leaving because of energy. In fact, I've seen them doubling down because they're some of the most resilient factories on the island. And, and, and when we're citing them here and bringing them here, we are talking you. Can you talk about your experience in, in that space as well? Yeah, so uh, just a couple of notes. Um, I think that the the energy concerns are are much different for local population that's that's at the sort of poverty line where they're not able to get a generator or other backup systems but at the pharma level um, th that's taken care of through backup systems and generators and solar panels so we, we've experienced no issues with that um, as, as a motivating factor to to, to to leave I haven't heard of anybody having that be an issue rising energy costs are a problem for everybody and in Puerto Rico energy costs are more expensive here but obviously getting a 50 cent tax credit on those energy costs makes it competitive. Lastly, I'm a Texan and my, my parents thought I was crazy to move to Puerto Rico and they cited the energy concerns. And now in Texas, my parents have a generator and are having way more power outages than we do in Puerto Rico. So I'd say the, 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 energy, the energy argument in Puerto Rico has not been a concern for any, anyone that I've known. I agree. A good, good example. There's a question regarding CGMP regulations of various countries. You mentioned, you know, Puerto Rico speaks three languages earlier. Do you want to build on that or uh, elaborate on that with regard to CGMP? I'm assuming this has something to do with sterile environments and FDA and things like that. Yeah, G GMP is good manufacturing practice. And so Puerto Rico is regulated by the FDA. So there's more FDA agents in Puerto Rico than any other state in the union. I think there's close to 2000 agents here because of the amount of activity. Um, there's no differences in uh, sort of quality by design or regulations for Puerto Rico versus California or Texas. So it's the exact same regulated by the FDA. The differences between Puerto Rico and a European um, a sort of quality audit are the same differences that you'd have in any other US state. So, so no differences there. All right. Um, one of the things that's near and dear to my heart is talent. And there's a question that says, what tools does Puerto Rico have to properly train and develop professionals in the regulatory and technical expertise that is unique to cell therapy? Um, I just want to, you know, I've had the ability to meet with Professor Madeline Torres Lugo at UPR Mayaguez and seen her NSF funded engineering center for cell manufacturing. I've also talked to the diaspora and and overseas and, and they're very fascinated with this opportunity because this is where the future of medicine is going what has been your experience with regard to to uh the training and developing of professionals you talked about you know where you found the 40 50 people that you've acquired so you hired so far um talk about can you elaborate on that uh, particularly with regard to the pipeline of talent in the universities here yeah, so um, first, P 
Puerto Rico has not only sort of pharmaceutical and generics manufacturing expertise, but biologics. And so I would say rough cut 70% of the scientific steps in developing and uh, commercializing a biological product are going to transfer to a cell and gene therapy process. And so there might be some unique aspects, very highly technical aspects of gene editing, CRISPR technology, some of the process development steps that are unique to each company that you'd have to train in. But a majority of the professionals in Puerto Rico will already have 10 to 15 years of experience. So that's comment one is that talent is readily available and already has the background. Comment two in cell and gene therapy, it's such a new and innovative space that there, there aren't training programs because a lot of this is being developed real time. And so you're around people that need to have experience solving problems in the biological spaces. And that's been critical. What I'd say in Cytoimmune's experience is, is we were able to go from signing uh, to get the building to our first shakedown run with cells in a little over six months, which is absolutely unheard of in, in terms of experiences with other companies. And then we were doing clinical production runs of our cells within 13 months. Uh, which is also unheard of. We've done a, a three different tech transfers for processes that we were doing in California, all of whom have gone on time and on budget. And so the proof is in the pudding, in my opinion, in that the, the team that we've been able to hire here has done an unbelievably extraordinary job on, on, on being able to pick up what we're doing and, and handle the tech transfer. All right. We, you know, with regard to the ability of Puerto Rico to fill uh, to, to play in this market. I have one question regarding supply chain. Um, it says, how can a filling and packaging machine provider support gene and cell therapy operations in Puerto Rico? Is there any opportunities um, for existing companies that you want to highlight? Or B, is there a supply chain partner that you would love to see come to the island? I, I think if if I understand your your question, um, that that specific fill and packaging need is a need for cell and gene therapy, like it is for any other pharmaceutical product. So that that would be clear. I would say that from a supply chain perspective, everything uh, other than cell source material is the same um, as as other pharmaceutical products for, for all practical purposes. So this is an excellent place to find supply chain partners and vendors that have the experience that you need in developing a product. Awesome. There's a, there's a question that really questions um, our history with where you're going. And, and it, it's basically the manufacturing versus the R&D. And the question says, do you consider Puerto Rico's advantage? Uh, do you consider Puerto Rico's advantages are primarily in a hub for manufacturing? or in its capacity for developing innovative biotechnologies. And I think to me, this reads as a difference between our history and R and D. And I would like you to comment on that as well as like, what part of the R and D do you think we're competitive in? Cause there's two parts. There's the research and development. I, I think I'd answer that a couple of ways. Puerto Rico has a very rich history of developing uh, products uh, and manufacturing those products in the in the pharma space once you manufacture a product there's constant research and development needed to improve the 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 line and improve, improve the manufacturing performance that's kind of number one but i see things a little bit differently i i have met the most innovative entrepreneurs in the world in puerto rico um, they've come here because the tax credits are important because these are founder-led mission-led organizations. And so I don't think the next Silicon Valley is going to be in Austin, Texas. I don't think it's going to be in Miami. I think it's going to be here. And I don't know where the group of entrepreneurs that are coming to Puerto Rico are going to take the island, but I'm very excited to know that there's going to be hundreds of different offshoots for developments that's going to happen here because of those entrepreneurs. Well, that's the second time in the second industry sector today that somebody said the next Silicon Valley is happening in Puerto Rico. So thank you for saying that. One last question I have before we wrap up here is, can you comment regarding us versus the states? Um, uh, we've talked about a bunch of countries. 
Um, but I, I will admit that we compete a lot with the state, the 50 states in the United States. And I'm trying to figure out, do you have any perspective on, on how we compete with them or who our biggest competitor is? Yeah, just, just very quickly, um, California, if you raise money in California from venture capitalists, you're going to get a 30% valuation premium. There will never be another Silicon Valley in the way that we currently imagine it. That's where all the early stage capital is. So that's very difficult to compete with. That said, remotely operating and raising money from California is possible. I think Texas is a great place to do business, uh, but there's no incentives in Texas other than the, the secret funding for cancer. So if you're not a cancer company, it's not it's not ideal at all. I, I don't see if any uh, advantages in Florida other than there's no state income tax, but there's really no reason to be in Florida over any other state um, outside of the, the living. Kentucky has a state matching program for SBIRs that's interesting for Kentucky based companies. Ohio is trying to to generate some really interesting niche dynamics uh, in their economy. But I, I just I don't understand why if you're doing a startup and you're going to be working 100 hours a week on that startup, you wouldn't want to have every advantage possible. And I think that's what you get in Puerto Rico. Wonderful. Great to hear. Um, I'm going to use some of those talking points. Um, thank you, Will. Um, I, we're going to have to wrap up here on behalf of everybody at Invest Puerto Rico and, and Cytoimmune. I, I, I'd like to thank our audience today for joining us. Um, I think it's it's huge what you've outlined regarding us being a best in class, the opportunity for state and federal, or in this case, Commonwealth and federal dollars and private foundations to save the equity of your company as you're growing it. Uh, you know, and I, I did notice that, and I hope our audience did too, that the size of federal investments over time, uh, as your company grows, gets bigger and bigger, um, as your financial needs get bigger and bigger. And, and I think, uh, you know, that's that's a, a really uh, important takeaway. And, and I really think that, you know, I I love what Australia is doing. In fact, I, I think they're copying us or, that, you know, I, I don't know. I think we might have been first before they came up with their policy. But I think our talent uh, is the, 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 the delineation between us and them is is our 60 year history and our talent. Um, it, this is a very helpful conversation. Uh, I think at the beginning, I hope we've uh, gotten a lot of people interested in this space and your example of cytoimmune has shown them exactly what can be done here. And, and we'd like to rinse and repeat and do that again. Um, for everybody on the call, I encourage you to visit our, our website, investpr.org, to learn more about this and other opportunities merging, emerging in Puerto Rico. You can contact our business development team, which is my team, and, by info at investpr.org. Also, Will's email is will at cytoimmune.com, um, and he's willing to talk to companies uh, directly as well. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that this is part of a webinar series that we're doing here. And our next webinar, which is the future of medicine in Puerto Rico, leading the way forward, will take place in May in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned to our platforms for all the details. And we hope to see you all then and, and bring your friends and keep plugged into Invest Puerto Rico and keep moving this industry and others related to it forward. So I want to thank you all. Thank Will again. It's been an excellent presentation. So once again, thank you to everybody. It's been a blast. I appreciate the opportunity. Take care.